Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. Um, it's particularly good to have the opportunity to show uh, the result of some investigation and implementation work that has been done by TechSot. And for me, it's particularly good that this presentation is in Texas A&M. So the, it was last, in the last um, session, it was good also that we did have a historical review of um, how material testing has advanced in TechSot. So what I'm going to show you now is um, how today we're still using testing and procedures and methods that are used from 1956, exactly six years ago. And today we continue using it. We're talking about the prediction of PVR. Why this is important? Well, here we have a map whoops, of the US and Here's a map of the US, and here we can see that in the entire central portion of the US, everything that in the little map on your left is blue. That means that we are in territory where there is uh, on the order of 50% or less, no? Uh, you're gonna have to give me a minute. No. Yeah, the mouse is lost, um, and it's frozen. Oh, wait. Sorry, folks. Thank you. It's an egg, computer. <laughs> Thank you. So here we are again. So here we have in central US, everything that is blue are units that contain less, but up to 50% of soils that can be considered expensive. Red means over 50% of soils that we can consider expensive. Now, let me remind you of something that according so with information that we get from insurance companies, the, this is the, probably the most important hazard or the most expensive hazard that we have in the US. Uh, the, the data that we have is not catastrophic as an earthquake, but the data that we have in terms of material costs indicates that the costs associated with expensive clays per year in the US exceed the costs of any other natural hazard, earthquakes, um, hurricanes and floodings combined. So, and in Texas, we are not doing particularly good. Here in, in, in red, you do see essentially along the I-35 corridor, we do have a significant problem associated with expensive clays. What does it do for TxDOT? Well, if we have a pavement over expensive clays, what will happen is the following. So uh, essentially the, the clays will swell when the moisture content increases and will shrink when the moisture content decreases. So when we have a pavement like this, um, the shoulders are the ones that are gonna have, are, have changed moisture content more easily, faster than the center line. So during the, during the rainy season, we're gonna see that the shoulders will heave in relation to the center line. And during the dry season, the shoulders will shrink. They will settle during, this, during the um, um, 
due to the changes in moisture content. So literally, and we're monitoring this, our pavements do flap. They do not fly, but they do flap significantly. And during the dry seasons, particularly pronounced dry seasons, is, this is expected. We would have longitudinal cracks all along our pavements over expansive clays. So this is what we have. It's a fingerprint. This has nothing to do with traffic. In some cases, we do see these, ex these longitudinal cracks, but potentially even before we open the roads to traffic. And this is what we call environmental loads. Okay? And the costs associated with this. In 2011, it was a tremendous distress in many of our low volume roads, flexible payments associated with this problem, environmental loads. Now, this is another view, very recent. This is in Buda, no, um, near Austin. And here we can see very clearly the longitudinal cracks associated with the changes in volume of our <coughs> subgrade clay soils. Sometimes we need a cartoon like this or a little model like this. Here we have a cross section on expansive clay. This happens to be Eagle Fork clay on a mm, simulant of a base. And we can see that as we advance the moisture content, we're going to have significant changes in elevation in the shoulders in relation to the center of our road. What does text tell us about this? PMD chapter 3, section 2. We do have, it's called sometimes a test, but it's really a procedure. It's text 124E, determining a potential vertical rise. Essentially, what this tells us is that we need to go to a column of 15 feet of soil and determine the potential vertical rise. Essentially, we need to characterize the swelling of that column of soil, and if the max, if the Potential rise when the soil goes from reasonably dry to saturation exceeds 1.5 inches. That's not a suitable design. What do we do? So this approach has very important pluses. It's, it, it, it has good practical implications. So the outcome, what is the vertical rise? How many inches our pavement is going to, it's not that it's going to, swell that much. It's not that we're going to have that, ri that rise specifically, but essentially what it tells us is that a, a potential vertical rise of five is worse than a location where we have a potential vertical rise of three. It's an excellent index that combines the right variables. The right variables are the material properties, the right the variables are the stratigraphy under my, under my road, the variables include what is the confining pressure under my road. The variables is what is the initial moisture under my road. All that is needed and all that is taken into account in predicting the PVR. Now, there are problems. First and foremost, uh, actually both are very bad. So too many correlations. In order to come up with that potential vertical rise, we need a correlation that correlates volumetric changes with linear strain. In addition to that, we need a correlation that relates the plasticity index to freeze well. In addition to that, we need a correlation that tells us for a given freeze well, how does it change with load? In addition to that, we need another correlation that will correct our prediction for unit weight. And in addition to that, we need another correlation that will correct our prediction with percentage binder, material that passes C number 40. Too many correlations, and essentially the reason is this is, takes too long to run the right test, which would be a swell test. It may take months to get one data point. And here we're solving this using plasticity index. But there is a second problem, equally bad, that the experimental data on which these correlations are based are really bad. It's not, at the time, they were great, but this was 1956, 60 years ago. So the data is old, it's dated, and very, very little data that we do have regarding that. And not only that, but without additional data, 
at some point, Textot extrapolated those correlations beyond the, 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 the limits where the data existed. Let me show you that. So this is McDowell's 1956 method. Essentially, in the vertical axis, you have strain, vertical strain, swelling in percentage, and on the horizontal axis, a correlation with an easy index, plasticity index of the soil. The two lines, the blue line is what happens when you start with a reasonably wet soil. It's gonna swell less than if you have a comparatively dry soil. Now, I plotted here the actual number of tests that were used to define this correlation. Multi-million dollar decisions are based on these few data points still today. Not only that, but at some point, text dot, and this is, what you, this is not what you see in text 124E, what you do see is this. So at some point, text dot extrapolated the lines, data was available for a plasticity index on the order of 60, 70, it was extrapolated to plasticity index on the order of 140. This is a very important correlation, very few data points, very data data. This is another important correlation that is needed in order to come up with a, with a, plastic, with a potential vertical rise. In the vertical axis, and again, this is a chart from 1956. In the vertical axis, you have the volumetric swell. How it changes for each one of these curves. Each one of these curves is a curve that corresponds for a given free swell, hmm? for a given swelling under essentially very limited load. How does it change with the normal stress? Hmm? This is data from 1956, and I don't know if you can see it, but look at how many data points we do have. An extremely limited number of data points. What you have in text 124E is essentially the same graph. What you do with this, this is strain versus load, which is kind of strain versus depth. So if you integrate the area below each one of these curves, you integrate the strains, you get displacements. So what you see in text 124E is essentially the integral of these curves so essentially you are getting, instead of getting vertical strain, uh, you do get inches. Mm -hmm. This is what we're using today. There is a good reason for having this stuck. Mm -hmm. And there, is a good re there are good reasons for that. Again, this was a very, I per personally believe that this is a, was a very good concept in one number five inches of potential vertical rise, you can incorporate the entire profile, what happens in the entire profile, and that's something that is not trivial to do. Why not better data? Well, if you're, we have specifications to, or testing procedures to do better with the data. This is the conventional swell test, but it requires significantly long periods of time Essentially, these are done in consolidometers. You need significant real estate. Uh, so, for example, here we have the swell testing that we would get. Uh, this is Eagle Ford Clay. Mm -hmm. So, here you have that essentially, in order to reach the ultimate swelling, it may take weeks, potentially months, in order to reach this data point. And this is to get one data point. What you really need. It's not the swelling, one data for swelling, you need an entire curve. So in here you have swelling, again, this corresponds to almost a month. So here you have the swelling for three different confining pressures, and each one of these you plot it here, swell versus load, and this is essentially the curve that you're looking for. Months to get this data point, so no surprise, why this didn't change over the past 60 years. So here was a great idea. What about if instead of waiting this couple of months or one month in order to get a data point in a reasonably big piece of equipment, we get a small piece of equipment, but we accelerate the infiltration process. And we can accelerate because we do not care about the actual time, we care about the ultimate product. How much is it gonna swell? So let's go and let's put it 
in a centrifuge and let's accelerate the infiltration process so that we are gonna get that swelling at a target confining pressure. We need swelling at different confining pressures and we can play with this at different G levels. At the University of Texas at Austin, I can see um, we do have a hydraulic centrifuge that essentially was particularly well suited to do this. Mm -hmm. It is high G, it's a high G centrifuge. It has essentially it's a flying permeameter. Those of you that test hydraulic, conduct hydraulic tests, think of this as a flying permeameter where you can have in-flight data. It's a hydraulic pump and you can get the data and you can monitor suction and moisture content and influx and outflux. Things were very promising, but they were not practical. The concept was we want something that potentially can be installed in TextDot laboratories. So this is the, essentially the testing environment on the centrifuge. Here you have the buckets that would hold the sample and accelerate the infiltration. So this is what we moved into, a reasonably inexpensive floor-mounted centrifuge that can monitor the swelling versus time. The big jump was when we managed to have an in-flight data acquisition system inside the centrifuge. And guess what? Instead of spinning one sample, we spin six samples at a time. This is a short present. Oh, so here we have one of the, this is our uh, holder of the specimen. And we're gonna be monitoring with a linear potentiometer how the specimen height changes with time. So we're getting the data in flight quickly. Typically within one day, our protocols is we test each one of these samples within two days. Now, I'm gonna walk you very quickly because telling you this now sounds reasonably easy, it was not. So this was the generation number one. We used, we couldn't put a data acquisition system in flight. We would spin the centrifuge, remove the sample, and they get the measurements. The concept was proven, but the data was not good enough. A big jump occurred with our second generation when we have a chip in flight that allowed the monitoring of in-flight data that was stored in flight. Good, promising, not so terrible resolution. Let's keep moving. So version three, this was the big jump. So we did manage to have a miniature in-flight data acquisition system that communicated wirelessly with the data logger in the computer. And after doing this, this was an Arduino type system, we managed to get beautiful curves. So here we have 24 hours. This is essentially a day. You go for play. We can monitor, a, here we have 20% swelling. This is huge in an order of a day, perhaps two. These improvements, I'm walking you very quickly over this. Very recently, there were additional improvements that allowed us to not only prepare the samples that we're gonna test, but also collect the samples in the field and test them as they come from the field and disturb samples, and more than that, to moisture condition them. A key aspect is what is the initial moisture content of your sample. We can condition the moisture content of our sample in order to define at what initial moisture we wanna run our test. This is the result. This is a typical result. This is, um, this is Montiola clay, I think. And we can see that essentially we get a very smooth curve, very well-defined curve. The termination point of the swelling is very well-defined. Uh, this is 100 hours, this is 20 hours a day, perhaps two. Compare that with a free swell test. This is our standard. Again, much slower, not well-defined termination point, but the important aspect is that the 
ultimate swelling that we get. That's what we want, the ultimate swelling that we get in a very expeditious test, in a very practical test, is the same that what we get under 1G. And here we have the typical swell stress curves that we obtain out of this testing program. This is Eagleford clay, vertical strain versus effective stresses. And this is similar data, but in this case green, uh, blue is centrifuge tests, green is freeze well tests. We define the same data with month-long tests than with days-long tests. And this is an example of the data that we collect getting undisturbed samples from the field. So we get here specimens in Shelby tubes, we can trim them into our centrifuge, and we can test them. These are two samples tested from in situ specimens, but we are not necessarily at the mercy of the moisture content at the time that we collect it. So what we have done in here is we can moisture condition the specimens to bring them to the moisture content, the initial moisture content that we want for testing, and this is the same soil, but with a moisture adjusted, a smaller moisture content for our test. And again, another swell stress curve, and this is Cook Mountain clay near Austin. Uh, blue centrifuge tests, red freeze well tests. This is another one, Eagle Fork clay, 20% strain. Red a ASTM tests, blue centrifuge tests. So, in summary, regarding the experimental component, uh, we have come up with a testing procedure that is expeditious, is highly repeatable, I didn't show you results. It generates swell data from multiple specimens at once. Uh, if you're gonna have this in your lab, requires reasonably limited real state. Uh, you do not need a battery of uh, consolidometers, for example. It provides a direct measurement of, your, you, for PVR, you need swelling. Instead of doing correlations with indexes to get that swelling, let's measure the swelling. And let's measure the swelling at the different normal stresses. And the, the, the important aspect is that this is, these swell stress curves are exactly what we need in order to predict the potential vertical rise. So, what is the current methodology? We're gonna run the tests. Typically our protocols are we run the tests at three different stress levels, typically 5Gs, 25Gs, and 100Gs. We're gonna generate this well stress curve from the centrifuge tests. We then is all we know from PVR. Those of you that have calculated PVR, you need to go to your soil profile, you're gonna discretize it, you're gonna define what is the what are the stress levels at the top and bottom of each one of your uh, sub-layers. You're going to define what is the initial moisture content and the soil characteristics of each one of the layers. Then you're going to define the, this is when you need those curves. Hmm? You're going to determine the swelling for each curve. For a given soil and a given initial moisture content, you come up with the swelling. The swelling times the thickness of your sub-layer is the contribution of your sub-layer to the vertical rise. You add them up and you have your PBR. Examples. All these examples, I picked examples from San Antonio. We've been working with Austin District, with San Antonio District, in some reasonably major data collection and implementation of tests. So here we have, uh, this is loop 1604. Um, data collected in Behar County, this is Houston Black. Here we, in this particular case, we decided, and this is not that you need to do this, but we decided to choose the initial moisture content using the reference, and we chose the reference to be the optimal moisture content. Even if it is an in situ soil, the optimal moisture content is a reference that can be obtained in the Austin lab and in the San Antonio lab and in the, uh, in, in the different labs, and they, we can come up with a unique reference and typically we test as a optimal moisture content minus 3%. This is this well stress curve. And again, we kept testing some here. These are freeze well tests. Just to 
check on us that we are getting the same data that we would get under 1G. And this is the soil profile, and this is what we get, a PVR with the actual data by getting the swelling without correlations of almost eight inches. If we get the text 124E, then we're on the order of five inches. In this case, we get a higher PVR than the one that we could obtain with text 124E. But there's no clear trend. It's not that this is conservative or unconservative. It's just different. Another test, another location, FM 1976, also in San Antonio district, Houston Black. Initial moisture content, swell stress curve. In this particular case, the clay is also Houston Black, different location of Houston Black. Mm -hmm. Swell stress curve. PVR profile, PVR, we calculate a PVR of 3.8, the text 124E is five inches. So we could have done an over-conservative design in this particular case. Third example, in um, this case we're talking about Monteola clay. Monteola clay, initial moisture content, swell stress curves. So at this point we no longer rely, we do not need to just hope for the correlation that was done six years ago based on an index is a good index, but it's very limited, plasticity index. We get, you want the swell stress curve, we get it. And here, predicted PVR is seven inches. The, had we used the 124E, would have been five inches. In summary, the procedure is consistent with PVR, which is a good concept. It captures the right variable. However, this procedure uses soil specific, and more than that, project specific. It's not a given clay, it's a given clay at a given location. Does not require co correlations. Um, and I could conclude that the text 124E is not an initial approximation of the actual PVR. Conclusions, the concept of PVR is useful and is good if we keep it, however, PVR predictions with 124A with TX 124E involve a significant number of correlations. And they are dated, and with the data, the number of data is extremely scarce. We can do better than that. There is a new technology. The use of centrifuge technology has led to the direct determination of the swelling in an expeditious and repeatable manner. The swelling results obtained using centrifuge testing was found to match, and actually match extremely well, the data obtained under 1G that takes much longer to obtain. And the data that we obtained, which is the swell stress curve, is particularly well suited to continue using PVR. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>